was blind, but now I see.
Welcome to St Albans for our morning service today, whether here in person or watching on the live stream. Good morning and welcome on this lovely, slightly frosty morning. It's beautiful outside. So my name is Kirsty. I'm going to be leading us through the first part of the service today. Um, I'm going to start with scripture because that's never a bad thing to do. Hebrews 10 verse 25 says this. Do not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. It is so good, isn't it, to gather together in Jesus' name. And it's good that you're here. Whatever's on your mind, however well or otherwise you slept last night, whether you've known Jesus for decades, or you're currently not too sure about this Christianity thing. Whatever, it is really good that you are here and we're glad. So, what are we going to do together this morning? We are here to be encouraged, comforted, challenged and changed by God's word. And James will speak to us from, James, from John 9 today. We're going to seek to praise and glorify our wonderful God in music and song, with thanks to our wonderful musicians and singers. We're going to pray together for ourselves, for each other, and for the world. We're going to do that all together in the service, but there'll also be the opportunity to pray with brothers and sisters after the service. And as that verse from Hebrews says, we should encourage one another in Jesus. So all those things that we're going to do together in the service should serve to do that. But I also pray that each one of us will find a way that we can encourage someone else this morning. Now, our first songs remind us of the wonderful things that Jesus has done for us and praises him for it. So let's encourage one another by singing these wonderful truths to one another and to the Lord. So please stand if you're able to sing, oh praise the name. Thank you. 
Jesus is indeed our hope in life and death, a sure and certain hope in all things. Do have a seat. So as we come before our Lord and our God this morning, we are aware, aren't we, that he is perfect and that we are not. We do not even live up to our own expectations of ourselves, never mind our creators. When we first come to Jesus, we are called by him to repent and believe. And although by his Holy Spirit we are changed each day to be more like him, we know, don't we, that we fail in so many ways still. But we do not need to be depressed by this. He has promised to forgive us if we turn to him and ask. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that's what we're going to do together now in the words of the confession on the screen or on your service sheet. So please pray with me if you feel able. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, it's going to hand over to my husband for notices. Morning. Morning, good morning. It's good to gather together uh, on this beautiful, bright, early spring day. Let's, uh, let's call it that, shall we, uh, this morning. So, a couple of things from me by way of notice. The first is to say, do not forget uh, to pick up your February news sheet if you haven't already. Um, and I've flagged it a couple of times already, but I, I do want to flag it again. The various services that are happening uh, around Holy Week, they are, they'll obviously be in next month as well, uh, but do make a note of those and join us for as many of those uh, as you're able to do so. Also, on your way out, you'll see an invitation, uh, and it's mentioned on today's notice sheet, an invitation uh, to and tickets for the murder mystery uh, over at Little Eaton. As part of our Easter events, we're doing a murder mystery uh, in the uh, village hall at Little Eaton. Uh, some of you will have participated in that when we last did it, I think a couple of years ago. Uh, great evening, good opportunity, good opportunity to bring friends. Uh, so uh, if you want more information about that, do speak to me at the end, and there's some little flyers about that. Uh, as well. And whilst we're on little bits of paper to pick up at the back, two things. Uh, first, Derby Bible Week. There's a leaflet about Derby Bible Week. Derby Bible Week is not the week after Easter, but the week after that, usually. Uh, so uh, have a look at the dates. Uh, that's a week when we take the opportunity to uh, join with other churches uh, on Monday to Thursday evening on other churches around Derby uh, and to look at the Bible together. Uh, uh, There's a guy called John T. Rhodes uh, coming this year. Some of you may know him, some of you may not. Uh, it, for those of you who are wondering what I've just said, uh, he was here a number of years ago and then uh, planted a church in Derby and then ran away to Leeds. Uh, so uh, the, um, that, that John T. will be joining us for that, so that'll be fun. Uh, so do join us for that. That's sort of what we do that week is we don't tend to have uh, our normal uh, evening and weekday activities. We tend to join in with Derby Bible Week. Pick your leaflets up. And then finally... Uh, and uh, not quite so briefly, uh, on the back, a couple of tables at the back in the foyer, if you haven't picked them all up already, uh, is the uh, annual budget letter. I know this is a little bit late, and you've been looking out for it week by week, and I'm sorry uh, that you've missed it so far, but it has finally arrived, okay? Uh, we just had to uh, clarify a few things before I could go to print. Now, you probably haven't had uh, uh, an opportunity to read this letter yet, and the sermon is not an opportunity to do so. Uh, but uh, if you uh, have a look at it when you get home, you'll see, uh, first of all, a great encouragement, okay? Uh, those of you who sat here 
uh, and listened to this presentation last year will know that at that point we had a significant shortfall between our expected expenditure and our expected income. And last year, by the grace of God uh, and by the generous giving of his people, that uh, shortfall was met. And so we finished last year uh, with a roughly even uh, budget. And this year, we have a much smaller uh, deficit. We always tend to start the year with a slight deficit because we tend to, uh, we tend to be cautious. So we're cautious on expenditure uh, and we're cautious on income. And that takes you in uh, two different di directions, uh, as you'd expect. So, uh, so give thanks for that, first of all. And the figures uh, are on the first page uh, of the letter. Also on the back, though, I have highlighted three things uh, that we are expecting to come to during 2024, uh, but that at the moment we don't know exactly what the cost is going to be of them, and therefore I couldn't give you any figures in this letter. thought I'd better let you know uh, of the things that are kind of in, in our plans for this year. Uh, the first of them uh, is to get running water and drainage uh, into the Smith Chapel uh, so that we can uh, serve drinks and make use of that room a little bit more effectively. So that's something we're looking at the moment. Uh, we'll obviously need to get some prices on that and see how much that's uh, likely to cost. Uh, the second item is flood protection for the church. Uh, as you know, we had a, a once-in-a-lifetime flooding event in 2019 and another once-in-a-lifetime uh, flooding event in 2023. So given that the river last November set a new personal best, uh, we are uh, expecting that we will need to uh, add flood defences to the church, which after 2019 we didn't think we would or uh, well, the advice was we probably wouldn't need to do that, but we're looking at that. We have no idea exactly how much that's going to cost. Um, we will hopefully be able to get some grants towards it, but I do want to flag that that's coming this year at some point, and we'll uh, come back to you uh, on that. And then third, and I think for me most exciting, uh, we are looking, uh, seriously at exploring what's been for us a long-term aspiration. That is that could we find a, a place in the village, a, a shop front, something similar, that it would allow us to uh, reach out more effectively in the village than we're currently able to do. Being here is fantastic because it means we have a car park uh, and therefore when we do big events, people can park, people can come on a Sunday. You, most of you, I know some of you walk, but most of you appreciate the fact uh, that you know when you come to St. Altman's on a Sunday morning, there will be somewhere to park. However, it does mean we're slightly out of the village for stuff in the week. Uh, we've had a long-term aspiration to get back into the village. I know we had uh, premises in the village briefly uh, a number of years ago, and we appreciated that. And so we're looking about how uh, we do that. That is, as you can hear, at the very exploratory stage at the moment. We don't really have anything more than an aspiration. We would like a place where we can do ministry, particularly youth and children's ministry. We, could, we would like a place above sea level, so that, <laughs> in all seriousness, so that the office can continue if and when we have further flooding events. Because realistically, brothers and sisters, we're going to have, this is going to happen again. Okay? Uh, so, uh, and then we need to explore what other ministry uh, it might be good for us to do. So this is one of those things where we've had this long-term aspiration and we add to it the realities of how do we best make ourselves more resilient post uh, another flooding event. So we're exploring that at the moment. If you're interested in that, if you think, oh, I'd, I'd like to talk some more about that, grab them at the end, talk to me. As I say, it's an aspiration at the moment which we're starting to explore, but that is something that we hope to come back to in 2024. Ask me about any of those things at the end. Ask me any questions you like about, uh, about the theology of giving at the end. That's fine. Don't talk to me about standing orders and direct debits. I don't know what anybody gives here, and I don't want to. Uh, so if you've got a technical question about giving, talk to Nick, who is hiding uh, from my sight behind a pillar, very sensibly. Um, okay, uh, finally, what, do, what, what am I asking you to do this morning? Well, what I would ask you to do is, when you've read the letter, to review your giving. Now, reviewing your giving does not mean putting your giving up, okay? For some of you, you are giving sacrificially, and you do not need to give any more. Some of you... Uh, may be able to review your giving and think, do you know what, we haven't increased it for a couple of years. We are actually able to do so. Uh, maybe you've benefited from, one, from a, a, a small inflationary pay rise or whatever. Maybe you can have a look at your giving and increase it. Maybe that's, your, that's the situation for you. Or maybe actually, uh, as you read the letter, you've never really been part of our giving scheme before, uh, and this is something that you'd want to explore more. Uh, do read the leaflet that you'll find, given to the Lord's work at St. Altman's, you'll find that uh, in the envelope as well. Uh, have a look at that. As I say, talk to me about that if you wish to, but don't talk to me 
uh, about the money uh, and think about whether you might be uh, want to uh, participate a little bit more uh, in the work of St. Altman's in a financial sense. Finally, if when you look at the back there isn't an envelope with your name on, okay, uh, and you've searched the right letter of the alphabet, then uh, please do pick up one of the letters that's marked Budget 2024. Uh, if, you haven't, if we haven't got a letter for you, it means one of two things. It means either you're not on our electoral roll uh, or, and or you're not on the list of people that we send information to, uh, the sort of G, what we call the GDPR list, the li list of people we're allowed to send information to. So that might also cause you to want to get on that list uh, if you're not already. Uh, here endeth the uh, annual update on giving. Uh, so uh, I will leave that with you. As I say, ask me any questions. Uh, email me in the week. Don't ever tell me how much you give. James. No children's slot this week, sadly. Um, so no big exciting jump up at the front. But uh, I am going to quickly update about what we're doing. So if you are... Uh, someone who is in year six or below, then you're welcome to come and join us in Sparks. I believe this week we're looking at uh, the story of David and how God protected David uh, amongst the threats of Saul and the attacks of Saul. So please do, I encourage you, ask your children about that after the service. I'm sure they'd love to talk to you about what they've been learning about. Uh, and if you're, over, if you're in high school, um, uh, under year nine, then you'll be joining in uh, Ignition, which will be on a fuel, sorry, in the other room, um, as normal. Otherwise, we're going to continue in our tradition of squeezing actions into songs that might not actually include actions or not, but we're going to try them anyway. So let's all please stand to sing. It's a light and a hammer.
up, they do be seated. For our young people, head across, whether it be into the hall or whether it be off into the vestry, it's good for us to take some time in prayer. Um, the various groups are listed up above me. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, I pray for our children and young people, Lord, that they come eager and excited to hear, receive, and participate in learning about your word. Lord, I pray that they come with questions, and that they seek answers, that they come eager to listen. And Lord, I pray as their church family that we continue to encourage and challenge them once their time separate from us is over, and that Lord, as a church family, we will collectively come together to encourage and push one another closer to you. Amen. Lovely. Children, off to your groups. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 35 and can be found on page 719 of the Pew Bible and 663 of the large print. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they laid down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. So as we begin the second full week of Lent, we start with some appropriate prayers. Let's pray. God of this bright, sad season, dust and ashes touch our face, marking our failure and our failing. Holy Spirit, come. Walk with us this day. Take us as disciples, washed and wakened by your calling. Holy Spirit, come. Take us by the hand and lead us. Lead us through the desert sands. Bring us living water. Holy Spirit, come. Lord God, may all that we do during this season of Lent come from you and draw us closer to you. As you healed the physically blind when you were here on earth, Would you heal our spiritual blindness from sin's darkness? Help us to pray with honesty and show us where we need to change. 
Help us to remember that your power is greater than our sin. With you, we need not be afraid. With you, we have everything we need. Lord Jesus, during this time of Lent, help us to balance our time and responsibilities with all that you would have us do to deepen our relationship with you. Through your Holy Spirit, give us a longing to read your word, to encourage, to bless, to love and to pray. May this season of Lent be a time of change and repentance for us all, so that we may experience more of your peace and freedom as we walk on our journey with you by our side. As we reflect on the 40 days leading up to your death, remind us of all you have done and the love that prompted you to do it for us. We praise and thank you for your willingness to leave the majesty of heaven for the squalor of this earth. At this special time, may we seek to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our world. As Ukraine enter their third year of this unjust war, our hearts are broken for their seemingly endless suffering but we continue to pray for a miracle. Change the hearts and minds of evil powers and give success, we pray, to those fighting them and those working for peace. Give strength and wisdom to both the people and their leaders and may they turn to you in their time of need. We cry out to you on behalf of the people so seriously affected by the conflict in Gaza and Israel. We grieve deeply at the devastation and suffering that we see all over the world, and we know that you do too. We pray for political, military and religious leaders everywhere to show a genuine willingness to work towards a better future for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our own country. We pray for King Charles, would you bring him healing in body, mind and spirit? We pray for our government and opposition. Would all Christians within our political bodies have an encouraging and positive influence for integrity, truth and compassion to all those around them? And we pray for ourselves. May we be friends and neighbours who are beacons of hope, sharing your light life and love through our faithful daily witness. May those who are suffering in any way know your loving arms around them and our prayers through their deepest sorrows. O Lord our God, steer the ship of our life to yourself, the quiet harbour of all storm-stressed souls. Show us the courage which we are to take. Renew in us the spirit of obedience. Guide and strengthen us to perform what is for our own good and your glory, and ever to rejoice in your glorious presence, for yours is the glory and praise for all eternity. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we finish by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 to 23, page 1079 in the Pew Bibles, or 9921 in the large print. 
John chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight, and asked them, Is this your son? that you say was born blind, how then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. This is the word of the Lord. Many thanks to Elizabeth, Jody, and Ruth for reading God's word for us and for leading in us in our prayers. So before James teaches us from that uh, John 9 passage, we're going to sing again. This might be a new one to you. It was new to me, but apparently you might recognize the tune. So the first verse says, In Christ at last we see in full God's splendor and God's grace. So let's raise our voices to praise him. Please stand if you're able to sing No Other Prophet. Thank you. 
Please do sit down. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that as we look at it together this morning, that you will speak to us from it. Give us our eyes to see and ears to truly hear from you. Amen. Well, we all know, don't we, that uh, seeing is believing. That is, uh, that when you see, uh, you believe that which somebody had told you about. It, it's sort of common, isn't it? We, it as children, uh, someone says, oh, I've just seen this. And you say, oh, let's go and see. And you go along and you see. And then you think, oh, right, yeah, okay, that's true. And perhaps not as interesting as I thought it was initially. That's how life uh, works. Thinks about those uh, experiments in chemistry at school. Chemistry experiments are the ones that live long in the memory. They're the ones that had the potential to go wrong. Uh, but the, the whole point of a chemistry experiment was to show you how it worked. I don't think, well, I hope that my chemistry teacher uh, wasn't... ...bring in discovering new knowledge. This wasn't the kind of experiment where you find out what happens if you set light to this. We did those experiments ourselves. But uh, this was sort of metered and from the front. Uh, and, and presumably he knew what was going to happen, but that was the point. He was showing us what was going to happen so that we would see and believe, yes? Yep, perfectly sensible. That's how life works. However, however, we also know that seeing isn't always believing. We know that sometimes we have to be cautious. Think about when you watch a magic show. In a magic show, you know that the magician is constantly trying to get you not to see what's actually happening so that you will see something else. So you will think that the young lady really is being sawn in half. Or that the card ends up on the top by process of telepathy rather than by sleight of hand. Or, what about perspective? We know, don't we, that sometimes when you see something, you know you're only seeing part of it. You're only seeing the end. Sometimes you see stuff happening in the street, and there's a part of you that says, oh, I wonder what's happening there. And there's another part of you that says, well, I don't really know what's happening there. I need to sort of be cautious before I wade in, thinking I know exactly what these circumstances are. We see things, but we know we're only seeing partially. And so, understandably, rightly, we're a bit cautious about what we do with that. So seeing is believing, yes. I've, I've got all day, it's fine. I've not got anything on. Seeing is believing, yes, okay. But at the same time, honestly, for good reasons, we, we are cautious sometimes about what we see. That's also true, isn't it? Okay, yes, James. And then there's a, another little wrinkle here, isn't there? And the other little wrinkle is the challenging, the problematic wrinkle. All those other things are fine, aren't they? The other little wrinkle is this. Sometimes we don't really want to see. Sometimes seeing should be believing, but actually it's not. Because we see it, but we don't want to see it. This morning, as we come to John 9, we are thinking about seeing and we're thinking about believing. That's what John 9 is all about. It's all about seeing and believing. So do come with me to John 9 if you've closed your Bibles. We're on page 1079. And what we get in John 9, basically, is a miracle and a reaction to it. So let's look at that first. Uh, we'll look at seeing is believing, uh, and then we'll look at some reactions to it. So, verse 1, come with me there. As he passed by, he saw a, bl a man blind from birth. Right, okay. Who's passing by? It's Jesus. Jesus is on his way out of the temple from John chapter 8. We're not exactly sure whether the events that happened in John 9 happened immediately afterwards, but Jesus is clearly still in Jerusalem. He's still ministering there. Uh, and as he comes out from the temple, uh, uh, he sees a man born blind. Now, why is the man born blind there? Well, for obvious reasons, because uh, the man born blind is not able to work. He is therefore uh, needs to uh, be supported by others. Uh, on the temple, on the way out, is a good place to sit in order to be given alms. Don't miss the link to chapter 8, though. All the stuff that's been in play in chapter 8 is still in play. So this is a, there's a sense of rising opposition, isn't there? Do you remember that? 
And Jesus has been proclaiming who he is. Before Abraham was, I am. That really majestic statement of identity that we read at the end of chapter 8 a couple of weeks ago. So don't forget that just because it's chapter 9, verse 1, not chapter 8, verse 60. All that's still going on. So here is Jesus. And of course, we start to ask the question, well, what's going to happen now? We're not, this is not an incidental detail. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Something's going to happen. We know it is. But before we get there, we get this little interlude, verse 2. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that's a bit of a surprise to us, okay? Because we do not draw a straight line. We do not draw generally any line between sin and this kind of suffering, understandably. But it was a common view in the ancient world that there was a link between that kind of suffering, whether it was blindness or something else, uh, and sin. Now, not everybody thought that, but it was a common enough view that the disciples' question is perfectly understandable. What really is going on here is that the disciples are misunderstanding how things work. We recognize, don't we, that in a post-fall world, after the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned, there is a link between sin and suffering. In a sense, all suffering is a result of sin. However, the Bible doesn't very often get specific. So all suffering that I experience is not necessarily a result of my sin. It could well be the result of other people's sins. We can see that sometimes. And it can also be the result of living in a fallen world where everything doesn't quite work as it should. So we can understand the question. And then we get, more importantly, to Jesus' answer. Verse 3, Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Well, there's a number of surprising things to notice in Jesus' answer. First of all, notice what the highest value is here. What matters most? What matters most is God's glory, that God's works might be displayed. When Jesus sees this man's blindness, he sees an opportunity for God's glory to be displayed. And that's the highest value, which is why he talks to us in verse 3. Notice also here, and we might miss this, the uniqueness of Jesus' activity. It's only Jesus who gives the blind back their sight. And this is why we had this passage from, passage from Isaiah 35. You probably noticed in the middle of it, this passage which is all about restoration all about God restoring his people, all about everything being righted, all about uh, God solving the world's problems. Right in the middle of that passage in verse 5 is that description of the blind seeing. It's a significant part of Jesus demonstrating that he is the Messiah. Think what he's just claimed. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. And so here is a demonstration of that that he will restore sight to the blind. And not just any old blind person, not just some sort of skillful fingernail surgery on cataracts or what other nonsense you were told at Sunday school. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the, not Sunday school, in school. Uh, this is the, uh, if you're already with anything like mine, this is the genuine work of God to restore that which has never been present. The man born from blind will receive his sight. That is a, unadulterated miracle. And so here, Jesus is going to act. But notice the little shadow that verse 4 casts. There's a timing issue here, isn't there? Jesus is working now, but a time is coming. Don't miss the context. We've had chapter 7 and 8 about rising opposition. We, we recognize, don't we, that here we are, Jesus is at work, but we are on the way to the cross. The, the time is coming when Jesus will be lifted up. All that in two short verses, Jesus reminds us of all these realities. And so, verse 5, as long as I am in the world, 
I am the light of the world. Jesus' acts reveal his identity. So he heals the blind man to reveal himself and to show God's glory. Here is the light of the world bringing light into darkness. And don't, rem- don't forget, of course, that there's, uh, there's a symbolic element to this all the way through, isn't there? There is the literal healing of blindness here. So the blind man who could never see will now be able to see. But there's also the imagery of blindness. And the imagery of not being able to see. And the imagery of light and darkness which goes through this chapter. That here is Jesus, the light of the world who comes into the world. But as John 1 tells us, uh, Jesus comes as the light into the darkness. And the darkness doesn't always want to receive the light. So although there's something actual going on here with the miracle, we're also supposed to be thinking, well, hang on. This is all about light and darkness, about seeing and not seeing, about spiritual blindness and spiritual sight. And so Jesus acts, verse 6. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And again we ask, what on earth is going on here? Why the mud and why the pool? Well, neither are necessary. We see elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus is able to, uh, is able to heal uh, without, without even a touch. So it's not that they're necessary. Why do they happen? Well, they're symbolic. They teach us something. First of all, the mud. Uh, the mud is, uh, and it's mentioned four times in the passage, the mud is a link back to creation. It's a reminder of the fact that from the dust, God made Adam. We're pulling in Genesis 2 here. We're, we're reflecting back and seeing this this curing of blindness as a recreative act of Jesus writing that which is wrong, of Jesus showing himself to be the creator. Remember how John began, the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word God. All things were created through him. So we're being reminded of that reality. And then the pool, well, John puts the emphasis on the name, doesn't he? The pool of Siloam, sent. Jesus is the one who was sent from the Father. He is the one, as John 3.16 reminds us, who has come from the Father, who's come to die for us. So we're being reminded about all these things, all these realities, as we read through this chapter. We're reminded, aren't we, that Jesus is the light of the world who shines in the darkness. He's the one who enables us to truly see. He is the word of the Father. He was in the beginning. He's the creator. He's the Lord. He's the sent one, the one who comes to judge and to save. The one who's come to die for us. Remember what we've already said about timing. We are in the shadow of the cross, aren't we? The opposition in Jerusalem this time will point to much greater opposition when Jesus returns to Jerusalem later on in John. We see then, don't we? And we see Jesus reveal his glory and therefore we believe. Or do we? Because as we go on through this chapter, we see three different reasons why Jesus' identity is seen and yet not seen. And I want us just to think about those three responses, and we'll see more of them next week. I want us to think about those three responses as we think about ourselves and seeing and believing. So first, as we look at verse 8 to 12, we see this issue. We see that Jesus' identity is too incredible to see. There is an issue here of plausibility. When something is really surprising and we hear about it, our first response is to say, well, that can't have happened, can it? And that's what happens here. Or there's another issue of credibility and plausibility, isn't there? Have you had people say to you, I wish I had your faith? Which usually means, I wish I had your credibility. I wish I could believe the ridiculous things that you believe that give you some kind of peace. That's usually what I think people are saying to me when they say that. I wish I had your faith. I wish, James, I was as gullible as you. Well, that's not a new problem. Look at verses 8 and 9. The neighbours 
And those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. Notice who this is. This is the neighbours. This is the people who know this man. They perhaps, some of them have known him from birth, okay? Some of them probably were there lamenting with his parents when they first realised that this boy could not see. And yet, some of those people, when they see this person who they've known for how many years he's been alive, and they know who he is, when they see that he can see, this is such a big change that they start saying, it must be somebody else. It must be the twin we didn't know about. It must be someone who just looks really like him and happens to be in the same place and that we've never met before. See what's going on here? This has happened. But it can't have happened. It can't, no, no, things like that don't happen. There is no space in my view of the world for this. I can't accept this possibility. See here that these first century people are not especially gullible. Uh, they're no more gullible, probably considerably less in many ways, than 21st century people. It must be someone else, they say, even though it's clearly, and they know it's the same man. They're perplexed. They just can't quite accept this new reality. So they said to him, verse 10, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. A couple of things to notice. First of all, notice that the man is a reliable narrator. He tells truthfully what happened to him. That's quite important as we go through because that's one thing that establishes his character. Remember back in chapter 5, when some, this was last year, uh, we were looking at this, uh, when someone else was healed and their response to Jesus was not great. It's not always the case, is it, that someone who's healed by Jesus responds positively to him. So one of the things that John does is he establishes the character of this man and says, look, this is a reliable person. How do we know he's reliable? Because he tells the truth. So he relates to us, to the people, exactly what happened to him. His character is important. So he knows he's been healed, but, verse 12, they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Don't forget, of course, that when the man was sent off to the pool to wash, he was still blind. So he doesn't know where Jesus is, and he doesn't even know what Jesus looks like. So it's perfectly reasonable for him to say, I don't know where he is. This is honest, but it's a little inconclusive end to this section. And I think it's deliberate because this section kind of leaves you with doubt, doesn't it? with this strange thing where this thing has happened and it's definitely happened. There is absolutely no doubt that the man who could not see can now see. And yet his neighbours and those around him are finding this really hard to accept. They just can't take it on board. It's as if the light is too bright. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't know what to do. What might this look like in our own lives? Remember, as we go through, we're seeking to uh, think about why it is that sometimes for us, seeing isn't always believing. What is it about Jesus that we struggle to take on board? Maybe it is the miracles. It wouldn't be a surprise if it was the miracles. Uh, many of us grew up with uh, a, a very particular worldview, didn't we? I grew up with a, in, in school with a modernist worldview. I'm not joking. Most of my RE lessons that I remember seemed to be about saying why miracles weren't miracles. That mostly seemed to be what I got at school at RE. I hope your RE was better than mine. Because within that modernist worldview in the, uh, in the sort of 80s, uh, there, was, there was this absolute prohibition on the idea of the miraculous. Nothing could possibly happen that we didn't understand. Now, of course, if you think about that, that's not a worldview you can demonstrate the truth of. You cannot possibly prove that nothing odd's ever going to happen. However, we were sure, because we did sure back in the 80s, didn't we? And so that's what we were taught. And so it wouldn't surprise me if some of you had a similar experience to me growing up, grew up in that same worldview, or, or when you went off to school, or when you off to went, went off to university, there's that assumption, isn't there, that we live in this closed box. Nothing from outside can enter here. There is no space for God. 
That's the worldview that we live with every day. So maybe we do struggle with the miracles sometimes. But there's plenty of evidence for it. All the way through John 9, the Pharisees want to find a way to get at Jesus. The one way they do not pursue, because they cannot pursue it, is to deny that the miracle has happened. My word, if they could have denied that the miracle has happened, they would have done. But they can't because it did. The historical record we have here tells us this. So we need to recognize and believe in the reality and possibility of the miraculous. We certainly need to see it happening in Jesus' ministry. And we certainly need to have confidence in a God who can do things that are unexpected. Now we can discuss and debate together how often we think that ought to happen. Fine, no problem. But what I don't think we can do is to say it's never going to happen. And what I don't think we can do is to say it never has happened. Our God is a God of miracles. Our God is a God who has power over all things and therefore can do that which is not normally, usually possible. We need to see that reality. Second then, Jesus' actions are too offensive to see. This is interesting. This is verses 13 to 17. Now, this isn't so much the question as to whether or not this can have happened. It's more about what should have happened and what should or shouldn't be happening. Now, for us, and we've already touched on this, that the bit of this passage that we find challenging is the bit about God's sovereignty. That the, the idea in verse 3 uh, that, that events can be arranged to reveal God's glory. Because as 21st century human beings in the West, we tend to assume that events are supposed to be arranged to reveal our glory. So that's what we struggle with. Interestingly, the Pharisees are not bothered about that. That doesn't worry them at all. Uh, they, uh, they have got other concerns. Look at verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, there's something interesting going on in here, and this happens a few times in the passage. As the neighbours come against this man and come against the, the, the reality of this miracle, they're really not sure what to do with it. But they do know this. They know they are not going to take responsibility for it. If there is blame, and there's probably going to be some blame as we see as we go through chapter 9, nine it's not going to stick to them. And so they do what you're supposed to do in this sense. They take, they pass responsibility on. They, as it were, take it to teacher. They take the man to the Pharisees so that they can examine him and see what's happened. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. And the reason they do that is because there is a particular problem with what's just happened. And it's there in verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the man the mud and opened his eyes. And again, we think, well, fine, perfectly reasonable. Why wouldn't you do a healing on a Saturday? Of course, in the first century, the Pharisees would have thought very differently. There's a good chance there are at least three things that Jesus does wrong. Things that you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath because on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to work, okay? Healing is work. Needing is work. Making a pace with the mud, yes? And... He anoints the man. That is arguably, depending on which Pharisee you talk to or which, uh, which rabbi, that is also work. So the issue here for the Pharisees is that Jesus is a lawbreaker. Again, there's no question that whether or not he did the miracle. The issue is when he did it and what on earth was he doing healing people on a Sabbath. Their argument would be, look, the man was still going to be blind on Sunday. Why didn't you heal him then? So they view Jesus as a law blaker. And it's potentially also the man who's been healed. He might be implicated too. Verse 15. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Again, remember that this formerly blind man is our reliable witness. He is accurate in what he tells us. And a miracle has clearly happened. But, verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. 
Notice they don't reject the work, but the source, Jesus is a lawbreaker. Again, we see that Jesus' actions cause division. It's noticeable. John has told us this a few times, hasn't he? It's not universally all the Pharisees or all the Jews or all the people who reject what Jesus says. It's most of them, yes, but it's not all of them. So again, verse 17, they ask the blind man, don't they? So they again said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Why do they ask him again? Well, I think they're hoping that because they've just made it really clear that they think Jesus is a lawbreaker, they're kind of hoping that, that, that the blind man, who of course is going to testify about this in the future, because don't forget what's going to happen here. In, in six months' time, the blind man's still going to be asking. Someone said, oh, aren't you the guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm the... Well, who healed you? Oh, well, this guy called Jesus, but, you know, he was a lawbreaker because he did that on the Sabbath and he shouldn't have done. No. That's not what the man is prepared to say. Again, notice, that his, notice the beginnings of his faith here. He is a prophet. Now, that's not a full description of Jesus, is it? We know that, but it's true. Jesus is the one who brings God's word to us. Notice the Pharisees can't deny the miracle, but they attack the one who did it. The man is being cross-examined, but it's really Jesus they want to cross-examine, isn't it? And I just want us to see what's happening here, really. Notice how they respond to God's actions and Jesus' authority with moral outrage. How dare he do this? How dare God behave in this way? How dare Jesus act in this way? Again, not a denial that he's acting, but a denial that he should be acting in that way. And you can find this throughout history. Again and again, people have raised this issue of how dare God do this or why isn't God doing that in our day? Where do we find it? We find it in that whole question of, of free will. We've touched upon that a couple of times already, haven't we? The idea that God's in control of everything. People find that offensive today. Uh, oh, and of course, we find it in suffering. People deny the existence of God based on the existence of suffering. You think, well, if God doesn't exist, there's not really any way of describing what suffering is. There's just stuff that happens, but never mind. Uh, so th there's all these things all the way through. This kind of moral argument comes and comes again. What do you think it is that our world finds offensive about Jesus? Well, normally through history, it's some aspect of Christian theology or some aspect of Christian morality. What about ourselves? Maybe it's the same things that we struggle to see. Maybe we do struggle with the idea of free will. We, we struggle with the idea that God's in charge. Brothers and sisters, ultimately when you examine that, that is a doctrine of great comfort. I, I'm joyous uh, in, in the fact that I'm not finally responsible. That God is sovereign. That he knows what's best for me, not me. Or is it, the moral, is it the morality stuff? I mean, fine, we want to have moral outrage, don't we, at the stuff that Christians and the church has done that's wrong. No problem with that at all. But there is in our day, isn't there, a moral outrage at the things that Christian teaches about basic Christian morality. What is it that we struggle to see? Perfectly reasonable to have questions, but in the midst of those questions, let's not miss who Jesus is. Let's not deny Jesus and reject him because we find some of his words challenging. And then that brings us finally to the third set of questions that Jesus is too frightening to see. We come to another interrogation, don't we? Verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? This is slightly understandable, isn't it? They, that some of these Jews, these Pharisees, won't have met this man before. That They've got this story that this man was born blind and that he can now see. So they're just sort of trying to probe it a bit more. Um, and the parents are called. Remember that in some people's eyes, the parents are culpable. Remember the question in verse 2? Did this man sin or did his parents sin? So the parents are in a vulnerable position. They're probably also not that wealthy on the basis that their son is forced to seek arms and to beg. So here are some weak and vulnerable people. 
particularly vulnerable to the Pharisees and to getting on the wrong side of the powerful Pharisees. So we can understand, can't we, their cautious answer, verse 20. His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. Yes, he's our son. They do not deny the relationship. Yes, he was born blind, but notice it there in the, out of the congregation. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. They're fearful, aren't they? And they're understandably fearful. We can see that at this point in this locality in Jerusalem where the Pharisees appear to have been particularly influential. Clearly, Jesus' identity is being debated. Some people are saying, well, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the Christ. Because, you know, he's saying this stuff about himself and healing people. And so it clearly is the case that in this local area, to say that kind of thing will get you into trouble. It will get you put out of the, put out of the synagogue put out of the place of worship. But not just the place of worship, of course. It will get you put out of the place of community support and action. So not only won't you be able to go to the synagogue for worship, you'll also not be able to benefit from the support that the synagogue offers. If you are looking for employment and you've been put out of the synagogue, that is a, a distinct black mark against you. This is dangerous. It was clearly uh, dangerous in uh, in, in Jesus' day, in that local area in Jerusalem. It was also dangerous in John's day, when John writes addition from many Jews to Christians. And that sort of putting out of the synagogue had become much more than a local action. So as we read these verses, we don't want to be too harsh on this man's parents, do we? We do want to understand, don't we, the challenging situation they were in, the vulnerable situation they were in. We can understand, can't we, why they would distance themselves from this threat. And yet, and yet, there's also a challenge here, isn't there? Because anyone who follows Jesus Christ will face a challenge or challenges for following him. There will come a point, won't there, for all of us when we are asked these kind of questions when there will be a social cost to following Jesus. Whether that's a social cost at home or a social cost in the workplace or a social cost in a different setting. By social cost, I mean life will just become more difficult for us. We might lose some friends and we'll certainly lose some social status. And so John kind of sets a challenge to us here, doesn't he? Will we follow the understandably fearful reaction of the parents? Fear of opposition, fear of ridicule, fear of the consequences of discipleship. Or despite opposition that we face, will we continue to follow Christ? We don't face constant opposition for being Christians. And there are some ways in which being a Christian in, in Britain remains a privileged position. And yet we all know of the reality of this kind of conversation, don't we? Particularly in the workplace, I think, but also in social settings as well. So the temptation for us is to let fear overcome us and not to really see. It's a temptation, isn't it, to reduce our commitment to a level that means that no one will notice. To not get too committed to following Christ because the consequences of that might be unpredictable. We need to hear the challenge of this passage, don't we, to truly see. We need to recognise, don't we, that Jesus is the light of the world. He is the true light and we see truly, yes, he may do things which surprise us, but he's able to do them. We need to see Jesus as the creator and Lord. His ways can be trusted. His ways are good, even if they're different to ours. Even if he does things that we don't expect. 
and we need to see Jesus as the sent one. He's the one who came to save us. Because Jesus came and died and rose again for us, there is no need for us to be fearful. We can trust in him, knowing that whatever path we take, And wherever discipleship leads us, it will lead us ultimately to seeing Jesus Christ face to face. So as we see the miracle, as we see what John wants us to see, let's make sure that our seeing is believing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and we pray that as we reflect on it today that you would help us to see Help us to know. Help us to see truly. Amen. Well, our final hymn reminds us, doesn't it, of uh, seeing and seeing, of true sight. I once was blind, but now I see. Let's stand and sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Please sit down. So, uh, 
as we draw our service to a close. Just before we do, do join us afterwards if you can for refreshments, tea and coffee uh, will be served uh, over there. Trays will also come round uh, so you can wait for those. Uh, do join brothers and sisters for prayer. Uh, you will find folk uh, through in the uh, Bradshaw area if you want to pray with them at the end of the service. Uh, through there uh, in the foyer, if you've not yet picked up uh, your uh, letter, uh, your finances letter, then do do so. Uh, and if, you, if there isn't one with your name on and you would like one, uh, do pick one up as well as we close the blessing. Christ the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for the sheep, draw you and all who hear his voice to be one flock within one fold. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>